Capturing the Smallest Animal in the World by Leon Augustus Hausmann, Ph.D. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Abai in January 2018. Capturing the Smallest Animal in the World by Leon Augustus Hausmann, Ph.D. From Popular Mechanics, Volume 37, January 1922. We have become a bit blasé during recent years to accounts of animals of prehistoric existence whose dimensions dwarfed those of our present animal forms. Possibly, then, our wearied enthusiasm for the unusual in zoology may be revived by a report of the capture and study of a creature which, in size, stands at the other extreme from the titanic dinosaurs of yore. The smallest speck which can be detected by the average unaided eye is a bit of opaque white substance, about 50 microns, 0 0.002 inches in diameter, seen against the black background. But the creature here under consideration is only one twenty-fifth of this size. A graphic idea of its extreme smallness can be had by comparing it with the ordinary human hair. In figure two is shown this, the smallest animal in existence, compared with a human hair, ordinarily averaging 50 microns in diameter. This diminutive creature, however, rejoices in a name which yields nothing in length and impressiveness to the appellations borne by the mightiest dinosaur science has to offer, for it trails after it the resounding cognomen of Pluromonas jaculans. In diameter, along the longest axis, its body rarely reaches a length of eight or nine microns, about one three thousandth of an inch, and the writer has often found individuals as small as two microns, one twelve thousandth of an inch. Figure one shows three typical individuals. The body is somewhat the shape of a kidney bean, with two long whip-like threads extending from a depression in one side. With these whips, known as flagellums, the creature makes its rather jerky way through the water in search of food, for it lives in pools and ponds amid decaying vegetation, where an ample supply of bacteria and juices from the disintegrating plant tissue is always present. These serve as its food, which is absorbed into the soft jelly-like area at the base of the flagellums. The life of a single individual is usually but a few hours. At the end of that time, the creature simply divides into two new individuals, both of which swim away, feed, and increase in size, and then themselves divide, and so on. In figure three is shown an unusual photograph of this most minute animal form of which we have record, magnified many thousand times. The capture of Pluromonas, while not involving any of the risk to life and limb which attends the capture of our largest living animal forms, the whales, still involves as great time, patience and perseverance on the part of the hunter. In figure 5 is shown the apparatus devised by the author for the capture of the protozoa, the first great division of animals to which Pluromonas belongs, under the microscope. By skillful manipulation of the tip of the pipette under the objective of the microscope, it is possible to secure single individuals of Pluromonas, and to transfer them either to glass microscope slides, or to sterilized culture jars, to breed a new race. And many failures, either to capture or to transfer these tiny animals from one place to another, is the lot of the hunter after the smallest animal in existence. Pluromonas claims our interest, not only because it is the most minute form of animal life known to exist on our earth today, but because it is of actual economic value to us as well. Often, bodies of water filled with putrefying plant remains will be colored a milky hue by the immense numbers of these tiny creatures, each one of which is a valuable scavenger, 
helping to transform decaying vegetable tissue into animal substance. The pleuromonas are devoured in their turn by larger forms of the protozoa, or single-celled animals, which again are eaten by minute crustacea and insects. And these last constitute one of the most important supplies of fish food. In many cases, therefore, these tiniest of nature's children are the ones to take the first step in the great work of making many of our waterways sweet and pure. End of Capturing the Smallest Animal in the World by Leon Augustus Hausmann, Ph.D. Discovery of Printing from the American Printer by Thomas McKellar. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The credit of inventing the art which perpetuates the history and achievements of all the arts and sciences has been obstinately contested, several cities having advanced rival claims to the honor of the discovery this however should be no matter of surprise when we consider that the inventor of a new art unprotected by law would naturally endeavor to conceal its processes for his own use and advantage after due consideration we agree with isaiah thomas in the opinion that the probabilities point to laurentius sometimes called coster coster and custos as the discoverer of the art of printing laurentius lived at harlem and was a man of property he seems to have been engaged in printing books from wood blocks or plates well known to antiquaries as the block books in which the reading matter was illustrated by rude pictures fragments of works so printed by him are still in existence among others the celebrated biblia pau perum executed between fourteen ten and fourteen twenty has been attributed to him it was only natural that his thoughts should be led to the production of single types as a means of cheapening and facilitating his work these were first made of wood and afterward of tin the date of his invention of separate types is given as about the year fourteen twenty nine other dates have been stated ranging from fourteen twenty two to fourteen thirty six the first of his printed books it is claimed was the speculum humane salvationis of which about ten copies are now known to be in existence a small primer or abacadarium in our opinion shows all the marks of the first attempt of an experimenter in a new art coaster died in fourteen thirty nine the necessity for employing workmen to assist in prosecuting the art led to the divulging of the secret among these men it is supposed was john geinsfleisch or gutenberg senior who after learning the processes returned to mentz his native place and communicated the secret to his nephew john gutenberg an ingenious artist of strasburg it is in evidence that the latter in conjunction with two partners spent a considerable amount of money in some private experiments these appear to have occupied several years from 1436 to 1439, when a legal contest arose as to the rights of one of the partners, whose zealous activity had caused his death. Gutenberg continued at Strasbourg till 1444, when his means being exhausted, he rejoined his uncle at Mentz. Here he renewed his experiments, and needing money, he procured an introduction to John Fust, a capitalist and moneylender, who seems to have been struck with the importance of the work and who advanced a considerable amount all the tools and presses being pledged as security in furtherance of the enterprise two years were occupied in making the types and necessary machinery when the great work of printing the bible was begun there can be little doubt that during all his years of experiment gutenberg had executed smaller books one of which is surmised to have been a reproduction of the dutch speculum of coster the donatus of 1451 the appeal against the turks of 1454 and the letters of indulgence of 1454 and 1455 all appear before the bible which was not published until 1455 or 1456 this great book marked an era in the art 
it is painful to be told that about this time Fust foreclosed the mortgage and the entire work with all the materials passed into his possession it seems however that gutenberg succeeded in re-establishing a press and continued to practice the art but produced no work at all comparable with the bible he died about fourteen sixty eight after securing possession of the establishment fust engaged the service of peter schoeffer who had been apprentice or assistant to gutenberg and who was distinguished for scholarship as well as mechanical skill his skill and the improvements made by him in the art soon led fust to take him into partnership and the bible the psalter and other important works were produced schoeffer was further rewarded by the hand of the granddaughter of fust from this rapid summary we may conclude one that the merit of the invention of printing however rude it may have been belongs to coster of harlem two that gutenberg placed the art on a permanent foundation and three that its economical application was ensured by peter schoeffer's invention of cast metal types it was of course impossible to conceal the knowledge of an art so useful to man and within ten years after the publication of the great bible presses were established in several german cities in rome and other parts of italy and soon thereafter in france and england william caxton acquired a knowledge of the art in germany and carried it into practice at westminster in england the year fourteen seventy seven is now accepted as the date of the introduction the first book printed with a date in england being the dict and sayings of the philosophers imprinted by me william caxton at westminster the year of our lord one thousand four hundred seventy seven he had previously printed without a date the recuyule of the history of troy which was followed by the game and play of the chess finished the last day of march the year of our lord god a thousand four hundred and seventy four these were however printed at bruges so according to mr william blades the first indisputable date we have to stand on is the printing of the dict in 1477 though at that time over sixty years old caxton was notable for his industrious habit he was possessed of good sense and sound judgment steady persevering active zealous and liberal in his devices for that important art which he introduced into england laboring not only as a printer but as a translator and author the productions of his press amount to sixty-four in the church warden's book of st margaret's parish westminster his death is thus recorded fourteen ninety one item at burying of william caxton for four torches six shillings eight pence item for the bell at same burying six pence the bible was printed in spanish at valencia in fourteen seventy nine by lambert palmert a german but so completely was it afterwards suppressed by the inquisition that only four leaves now remain in the archives of valencia the first hebrew bible ever printed came from the press of abraham colorito at soncino in fourteen eighty eight a very remarkable work iceland had its printing office in fifteen thirty at which a bible was printed in fifteen eighty four end of discovery of printing from the American Printer by Thomas MacKellar, read by Phil Schempf. Equal Rights in the Lecture Room Letter to the Committee of the New Bedford Lyceum, November 29, 1845 By Charles Sumner, 1811-1874 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. After accepting an invitation to lecture at the Lyceum at New Bedford, Mr. Sumner, learning that colored persons were denied membership and equal opportunities with white persons, refused to lecture, as appears in the following letter, which was published in the paper of the time shortly afterwards the obnoxious rule was rescinded and mr sumner lectured boston november twenty ninth eighteen forty five my dear sir 
i have received your favour of november twenty four asking me to appoint an evening in february or march to lecture before the new bedford lyceum in pursuance of my promise on receiving the invitation of your lyceum i felt flattered and in undertaking to deliver a lecture at some time to be appointed afterwards i promised myself particular pleasure in an occasion of visiting a town which i had never seen but whose refined hospitality and liberal spirit as described to me awakened my warmest interest since then i have read in the public prints a protest purporting to be by a gentleman known to me by reputation who are members of the lyceum and some of them part of its government from which it appears that in former years tickets of admission were freely sold to colored persons as to white persons and that no objection was made to them as members but that at the present time tickets are refused to colored persons and membership is also refused practically though by special vote recently adopted they are allowed to attend the lectures without expense provided they will sit in the north gallery from these facts it appears that the new bedford lyceum has undertaken within its jurisdiction to establish a distinction of caste not recognized before one of the cardinal truths of religion and freedom is the equality and brotherhood of man in the sight of god and of all just institutions the white man can claim no precedence or exclusive privilege from his color it is the accident of an accident that places a human soul beneath the dark shelter of an african countenance rather than beneath our colder complexion nor can i conceive any application of the divine injunction do unto others as you would have them do unto you more pertinent than to the man who founds a discrimination between his fellow men on difference of skin it is well known that the prejudice of color which is akin to the stern and selfish spirit that holds a fellow man in slavery is peculiar to our country it does not exist in other civilized countries in france colored youths at college have gained the highest honors and been welcomed as if they were white at the law school there i have sat with them on the same benches in italy i have seen an abyssinian mingling with monks and there was no apparent suspicion on either side of anything open to question all this was christian so it seemed to me in lecturing before a lyceum which has introduced the prejudice of color amongst its laws and thus formally reversed an injunction of highest morals and politics i might seem to sanction what is most alien to my soul and join in disobedience to that command which teaches that the children of earth are all of one blood i cannot do this i beg therefore to be excused at present from appointing a day to lecture before your lyceum and i pray you to lay this letter before the lyceum that the ground may be understood on which i deem it my duty to decline the honor of appearing before them i hope you will pardon the frankness of this communication and believe me my dear sir very faithfully yours charles sumner to the chairman of the committee of the bedford lyceum end of equal rights in the lecture room by charles sumner 1811 to 1874george hegel's psychology from hegel as the national philosopher of germany published in 1874 by dr karl rosenkrantz 1805 to 1879 translated by granville stanley hall 1846 to 1924 this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org the presupposition for hegel's philosophy of right of the state and of history was not as is commonly said his logic alone but no less his psychology 
since locke's philosophy psychology has become properly a central science to which investigation was directed with special predilection and proceeding from which it was attempted to ground the other sciences ethics ascetics and religious doctrine in this the germans had accomplished no less significant results than the english and the french with kant's critique of pure reason the conception of consciousness advanced so far into the foreground as entirely to absorb psychology kant left behind him an anthropology which was an ingenious and elegant discourse on the principal elements of psychology his scientifically established psychology will ever be sought in the transcendental ascetics and the logic of his critique of reason especially in the chapter on the deduction of categories fichte had no psychology outside of the science of knowledge schelling none outside of his transcendental idealism herbart again had psychology because he replaced the ego as the subject which maintains itself by notions or stolen since he regarded these as psychic quanta which are related to one another with an external independence his psychology became therefore essentially a theory of the mechanism of notions which made the spontaneity of the ego illusory hegel apprehended psychology from a higher principle which distinguished his philosophy from all others from the idea of spirit he distinguished one the subjective two the objective three the absolute mind and thus brought light into a region which had been desolated by the most extreme confusion under the first designation he understood the individual mind which he developed from its naturalness to formal freedom under the second mind as it determines itself in its action by the idea of good under the third mind as in art religion and science it elevates itself to intuition to feeling and to the conception of the absolute the conception of subjective mind again hegel distinguished in three special moments one that of the soul two that of consciousness three that of mind as special sciences he named them respectively anthropology phenomenology and psychology this latter designation i think he would have done better to omit since the name psychology had already come into use for all which he comprised in the doctrine of subjective mind it must remain the general name and hegel might quite properly have called the third part pneumatology a name of which earlier metaphysics had made use under this term hegel understood the entire sphere of the unconscious in man as far as it was still determined by nature immediately as mind it is the passive side of man so far as it appears in its natural qualities changes and in the conflict of the soul with its corporeity in order to make it the symbolic expression of its interior or content one should contemplate the confusion with which before hegel the conception of race temperament talent sex periods of age sleep and waking dreaming custom mimicry etc had been casually treated in order to realize the immeasurable progress he has made here here as in ethics he causes to be conceived a still more strict ordination a still more interior concatenation of determinations than he has presented but the credit of laying the foundation for this connected treatment must remain with him the chief difficulty in human psychology lies in correctly apprehending thought in its unity as well as in its distinction from sensation the animal cannot pass beyond sensation while with man thought constitutes the active principle from the very first and even in his sensations 
apparently he sets out empirically from sensation but essentially he bears himself even in sensation as an intrinsically rational subject the animal as sentient remains in individuality man exalts himself from the individual to the universal we call thought so far as it is opposed to sensation consciousness consciousness however does not arise at first successively but is originally present in man as his thinking relation to himself immediately man does not yet know that he thinks original consciousness is unconsciousness the ego already exists in itself on sich but not for itself hence consciousness within the sphere of the unconscious can be apprehended only as a self still in its natural state sleeping and waking etc are natural changes contrasted conditions the human state of wakefulness is distinguished from that of animals by the fact that man comes into relation not only to sensuous objectivity but that he also distinguishes himself for himself from his relation it may be contested where the conception of waking should be treated but in this case we must not be confused but must hold fast to the principle it is for this reason that the dream belongs to the sphere of the unconscious although it presupposes the formation of notions and of intuitions while we dream the free distinction of self as subject from objectivity does not occur the condition of dreaming is sleep sleep is however an act of natural vitality for example of a natural process which is independent of thought lunacy is likewise a decadence into unconsciousness the lunatic has a formal consciousness but he is involved in a condition of unconsciousness so far as concerns his crazy notions with respect to these he is not free like the dreamer with respect to the images which hover past in his chaotic soul when the lunatic is freed from his illusion this return to free subjectivity is analogous to awaking from a dream the condition of daydreaming as well as that of somnambulism must be placed in the category of unconsciousness although their mediation may belong to much higher spheres hegel treated the conception of consciousness under the name of phenomenology it constitutes the antithesis of anthropology for in this all determinations are necessary are posited by nature while with consciousness the freedom of thought arises as in itself infinite self-determination as subjectivity which makes as its object its own entire psychic individuality with all its qualities changes and conditions as moments of phenomenology hegel distinguished one consciousness two self-consciousness three rational self-consciousness subject distinguishes itself first from others secondly from itself thirdly from the universal conception which it finds as the identical bond between its outer and inner world reason is the identical essence as well as objectivity in itself as of subjectivity in itself unquestionably this course is a process of knowledge but very different from that which he presented later under the name of theoretical intelligence for consciousness recourse must ever be had to the antithesis of subject and object the object is either given in existence external to me which i seek to know according to its truth or i make myself an object but find objects outside of myself which like me are subjects for themselves or finally i find the conception of reason the necessity of which is the same without as within me in his development hegel organically integrated the great achievement of kant 
and fichte in finding the conception of consciousness for science by so doing however he aroused the greatest opposition philosophy had again given up the doctrine of consciousness and had again fused it with that of theoretical intelligence just as even so strict a hegelian as michelet seeks to be had done but here also we must submit to the consequences of the principle the antithesis of natural psychic individuality is subjectivity as which thinking yet inseparate from will distinguishes itself from itself as ego that which in the third part of his science of subjective mind hegel calls especially mind is a conception which transcends that of the rational self-consciousness by virtue of the fact that the subject as rational becomes content no less than form as individuality it bears a passive relation to be as it were a genius the individual must become self-complacent as subjectivity it is essentially actuosity consciousness itself posits the difference as well as the unity of subject and object but it is still dependent upon that which is presented as its object and does not itself produce the categories of reason though it explores the entire world without and within self knowledge of these is what it produces the subject in itself is truly free only when it produces itself in both form and content freedom holds the antithesis of theoretical and practical in itself the theoretical is the condition of the practical in the same way that individuality is the condition of subjectivity or that this latter is the condition of spirituality in the treatment of theoretical intelligence hegel distinguished one intuition Antoine, two imagination Vorstellen, three thought mind as immediate substance is feeling which as the proper content of mind is progressively formed through it from intuition yet involved in space and time to pure thought the content is the same through all the different steps of intuition imagination and thinking but i change its form and thereby give myself another relation to it i intuit for example the sun as a luminous round body it becomes night and i see it no longer but i have a mental image of it within myself by this image i have freed myself from the externality of the phenomenon the image as a purely ideal object is absolutely fluid i can bring it into relation with a thousand other objects it is also general i can subsume other similar bodies under the notion sun but necessity is wanting when i add this to generality i change imagination to thought the sun is the central body of a planetary system with this apprehension these relations which i can arbitrarily give to the notion of a sun cease and necessary relations take their place nothing is more frequent in the ordinary psychology and logic than the confusion of intuition imagination and thought because they cohere most closely in fact it remains an immortal service of hegel's that he has elucidated their difference upon the foundation which kant's critique of reason afforded the first and exhaustive discussion of his doctrine is found in karl daub's anthropology but it is as though this labor had never been performed there is also a presentation of the entire doctrine of the subjective mind by hegel himself which is generally entirely ignored when after his death his entire works were published dr Buhlmann undertook to add a commentary from hegel's lectures on the corresponding topics to the short paragraphs of the encyclopedia which he very admirably executed 
here hegel entered very intelligibly into all the difficult points of his systematology he showed in how extended a way he was familiar with the empirical material in the expression of psychic phenomena he evinced himself an ingenious soul painter whom the most delicate shadings of his object did not escape this he did especially in his delineations of the diseases of the soul of somnambulism custom temperament etc among the numerous dissensions of psychologists two points have become generally prominent since hegel's death which we will briefly mention one is the conception of attention the other that of language to attend is according to hegel the act by which the mind distinguishes a content which is present to it as sentient from itself and from other content in itself the condition for this act is therefore that i am subject that i distinguish myself as ego from myself and thereby from all which immediately i am not he presupposes consciousness so long as i exist only as sentient i cease to exist in the specialty of that which i feel but because i am subject i can distinguish myself from myself as a sentient individual i can direct myself in free self-determination to my immediate being this spontaneous direction is attention sensuous certainty and apprehension are moments of this act through it i make my feelings an object for myself i strip off from its content the external time and space conditions wherein i find it i transfer it into the ideal space and the ideal time of consciousness by so doing i make it an intuition which as being in me and remembered by me becomes a mental image the animal is also attentive but only as a sentient individual it remains dependent upon sensuousness there exists a movement of sensation but not a free activity of self-determination the animal cannot form its sensations into intuitions and since intuition again is a condition of representation it can still less reach the latter the animal cannot make its conditions present to itself when a man says he feels that it is warm he has already advanced beyond feeling although it still exists in him as a condition the word intuition is of course derived originally from the sense of sight though it has acquired a general significance for that content which is projected from feeling into consciousness the expression representation is correct in so far as it is intuition which is reproduced by the subject in and from itself representation is free from the connection which intuition bears to feeling it makes the content of intuition independent of a free image from which all that is casual and unessential in the original genesis is omitted representations for example stream wood animal anger command etc are general every representation as such is different from every other but the representing subject distinguishes itself also from its representations and is free from them since they attain existence only through his own activity when a subject ceases to hold the power over its representations it either becomes lunatic or it dreams that which the school of herbart has elaborated as a mechanism of representation into an extended dynamics and statics of representation in the intelligible tract of consciousness is essentially a psychological disguise of the laws of thought we can cast heterogeneous representations promiscuously together as for example in reading books for children in order to exercise them on the particular letter bridge book buck blood ball etc occur promiscuously 
but when we arrange our conceptions we do it according to logical laws language originates according to hegel from the incitement which we feel at the moment in which we wish to express a conception to make a sound as its sign if we had no organs of speech we should of course be able to produce no word in this respect there exists between our mind and organism a teleological connection without thinking we should only express feelings by inarticulate sounds like animals deaf mutes can of themselves alone advance only as far as notions but since they can have no idea of sound they remain dumb and can furnish themselves with a language only by the indirect method of writing as soon as a child endowed with perfect senses begins to form notions it begins to take pleasure in words when we say that language is produced without consciousness we mean to designate merely the unintentionality of the form of the sound and of the grammatical organization this latter is an actual proof that the language forming mind is rational in itself language is the renaissance of notions in phonetic forms which are the peculiar product of mind the reproduction of the notion as such without reference to the sound which custom has fixed to it among a given people we call recollection or reminiscentia recordatio recollection in the form of words is memory language on the one hand is the product of the thought which is latent in its construction on the other hand it is the condition of its development now also it becomes clear how much the self-formation of thought in the construction of conceptions in the passing of judgments and in drawing conclusions is distinguished from those forms which it possesses as consciousness for example as relation of subject and object there exists no psychology except the hegelian which so well develops the interconnection of the forms of the theoretical intelligence the origin of language the consequent process of the transformation of knowledge from step to step the practical relationship of mind proceeds also from feeling as impulse but is mediated especially by difference of theoretical relation it is indeed very pleasant to speak only of will and of representation as schopenhauer's philosophy does without actually deducing its idea so that instinct appetite desire passion and will are thrown promiscuously together but for the critical inspection of science a process so full of confusion cannot succeed such expressions as desires will etc admit a very indeterminate usage but science it should be said exists precisely in order to determine their usage more accurately without thereby destroying their current identity hegel assigned also to eudemonism its systematic position in his psychology and thus freed ethics from all those errors which arise when it is confounded with the idea of good instinct propensity appetite desire passion comes to an end in attaining satisfaction it is agreeable to the subject but the enjoyment of this happiness is quite relative the manifoldness of natural individuality modifies the kind and manner of satisfaction unlimitedly the composition of the means of enjoyment opens in another direction a new infinity of qualitative and quantitative differences which by the opinion of men by popular prejudice and by fashion are modified again without limit that which was at first felt to be pleasure is converted by excess into its opposite or is degraded to something quite indifferent here is never firm ground for ethics schopenhauer has made a great impression upon his contemporaries by choosing the words of goethe's faust 
thus i reel from desire to gratification and in gratification i pine for desire as the text of his gospel of pessimism the thinking man who by his intellect knows the torment to which will of nature condemns all that has life can only have the profoundest pity for that which he attempts to make the principle of ethics but pity is also an entirely relative feeling for it depends partly upon the notion which i form of the wretched condition of myself or of another and partly upon the degree in which this notion is developed here also is nothing but relativity eudemonism demands continuous pleasure there must be no pain here hegel adopted all the rigorism of kant in regarding happiness as an element out of which for ethics a motivation but no principle of action could arise the difference of desires inclinations and passions compels man to reflect as to which of them he shall yield the precedence of satisfaction the eudemonist is constrained to moderation in order to compute for his well-being the correct total well-being must however be subordinated to good the idea of which alone is adequate to stand for the thinking man as the principle of ethics with hegel eudemonism is not represented as a mere illusion as imposture as it is by schopenhauer well-being with its pleasure and displeasure should have no other justification than is permitted it by the idea of good hegel's philosophy may be regarded as the interpretation of another passage of goethe's faust who at the close of his experiences sums them up in the result they alone deserve life and freedom who are daily obliged to conquer it End of George Hegel's Psychology From Hegel as the National Philosopher of Germany by Karl Rosenkrantz Translated from the German by Granville Stanley Hall Published in 1874「The Hymn of Creation – Excerpt » by Carl Gustav Jung Translated by Bertrice M. Hinkle From Psychology of the Unconscious Published 1916 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org The second chapter in Miss Miller's work is entitled Gloria Adieu, Poem Onerique when twenty years of age miss miller took a long journey through europe we leave the description to her after a long and rough journey from new york to stockholm from there to petersburg and odessa i found it a true pleasure to leave the world of inhabited cities and to enter the world of waves sky and silence i stayed hours long on deck to dream stretched out in a reclining chair the histories legends and myths of the different countries which i saw in the distance came back to me indistinctly blended together in a sort of luminous mist in which things lost their reality while the dreams and thoughts alone took on somewhat the appearance of reality at first i even avoided all company and kept to myself lost wholly in my dreams where all that i knew of great beautiful and good came back into my consciousness with new strength and new life i also employed a great part of my time writing to my distant friends reading and sketching out short poems about the regions visited some of these poems were of a very serious character it may seem superfluous perhaps to enter intimately into all these details if we recall however the remark made above that when people let their unconscious speak they always tell us the most important things of their intimate selves then even the smallest detail appears to have meaning valuable personalities invariably tell us through their unconscious things that are generally valuable so that patient interest is rewarded 
miss miller describes here a state of introversion after the life of the cities with their many impressions had been absorbing her interest with that already discussed strength of suggestion which powerfully enforced the impression she breathed freely upon the ocean and after so many external impressions became engrossed wholly in the internal with intentional abstraction from the surroundings so that things lost their reality and dreams became truth we know from psychopathology that certain mental disturbances exist which are first manifested by the individuals shutting themselves off slowly more and more from reality and sinking into their fantasies during which process in proportion as the reality loses its hold the inner world gains in reality the determining power this process leads to a certain point which varies with the individual when the patients suddenly become more or less conscious of their separation from reality the event which then enters is the pathological excitation that is to say the patients begin to turn towards the environment with diseased views to be sure which however still represent the compensating although unsuccessful attempt at transference the methods of reaction are naturally very different i will not concern myself more closely with this here this type appears to be generally a psychological rule which holds good for all neurosis and therefore also for the normal in a much less degree we might therefore expect that miss miller after this energetic and persevering introversion which had even encroached for a time upon the feeling of reality would succumb anew to an impression of the real world and also to just as suggestive and energetic an influence as that of her dreams let us proceed with the narrative but as the journey drew to an end the ship's officers outdid themselves in kindness toutes ces coulées a des plumes impressées et du plus amiable and i passed many amusing hours teaching them english on the sicilian coast in the harbour of catania i wrote a sailor's song which was very similar to a song well known on the sea brine wine and damsels fine the italians in general all sing very well and one of the officers who sang on deck during night watch had made a great impression upon me and had given me the idea of writing some words adapted to his melody soon after that i was very nearly obliged to reverse the well-known saying veder napoli e poi mourir that is to say suddenly i became very ill although not dangerously so i recovered to such an extent however that i could go on land to visit the sights of the city in a carriage this day tired me very much and since we had planned to see pisa the following day i went on board early in the evening and soon lay down to sleep without thinking of anything more serious than the beauty of the officers and the ugliness of the italian beggars one is somewhat disappointed at meeting here instead of the expected impression of reality rather a small intermezzo a flirtation nevertheless one of the officers the singer had made a great impression il maviat fait beaucoup de impression the remark at the close of the description sans songer a rien de plume serio la la bouteille des officers and so on diminishes the seriousness of the impression it is true the assumption however that the impression openly influenced the mood very much is supported by the fact that a poem upon a subject of such an erotic character came forth immediately brine wine and damsels fine and in the singer's honor one is only too easily inclined to take such an impression lightly and one admits so gladly the statement of the participators when they represent everything as simple and not at all serious i dwell upon this impression at length because it is important to know that an erotic impression after such an introversion has a deep effect and is undervalued possibly by miss miller 
the suddenly passing sickness is obscure and needs a psychologic interpretation which cannot be touched upon here because of lack of data the phenomena now to be described can only be explained as arising from a disturbance which reached the very depths of her being from naples to livorno the ship travelled for a night during which i slept more or less well my sleep however is seldom deep or dreamless it seemed to me as if my mother's voice awakened me just at the end of the following dream at first i had a vague conception of the words when the morning stars sang together which were the preludium of a certain confused representation of creation and of the mighty chorals resounding through the universe in spite of the strange contradictory and confused character which is peculiar to the dream there was mingled in it the chorus of an oratorio which had been given by one of the foremost musical societies of new york and with that were also memories of milton's paradise lost then from out of this whirl there slowly emerged certain words which arranged themselves into three strophes, and indeed they seemed to be in my own handwriting on ordinary blue-lined writing paper on a page of my old poetry book which i always carried around with me in short they appeared to me exactly as some minutes later they were in reality in my book miss miller now wrote down the following poem which she arranged somewhat a few months later to make it more nearly in her opinion like the dream original when the eternal first made sound a myriad ears sprang out to hear and throughout all the universe there rolled an echo deep and clear all glory to the god of sound when the eternal first made light a myriad eyes sprang out to look and hearing ears and seeing eyes once more a mighty choral took all glory to the god of light when the eternal first gave love a myriad hearts sprang into life ears filled with music eyes with light pealed forth with hearts with love all rife all glory to the god of love before we enter upon miss miller's attempt to bring to light through her suppositions the root of this subliminal creation we will attempt a short analytic survey of the material already in our possession the impression on the ship has already been properly emphasized so that we need have no further difficulty in gaining possession of the dynamic process which brought about this poetical revelation it was made clear in the preceding paragraphs that miss miller possibly had not inconsiderably undervalued the importance of the erotic impression this assumption gains in probability through experience which shows that very generally relatively weak erotic impressions are greatly undervalued one can see this best in cases where those concerned either from social or moral grounds consider an erotic relation as something quite impossible for example parents and children brothers and sisters relations homosexual between older and younger men and so on if the impression is relatively slight then it does not exist at all for the participators if the impression is strong then a tragic dependence arises which may result in some great nonsense or be carried to any extent this lack of understanding can go unbelievably far mothers who see the first erections of the small son in their own bed a sister who half playfully embraces her brother a twenty-year-old daughter who still seats herself on her father's lap and then has strange sensations in her abdomen they are all morally indignant to the highest degree if one speaks of sexuality finally the whole education is carried on with the tacit agreement to know as little as possible of the erotic and to spread abroad the deepest ignorance in regard to it it is no wonder therefore that the judgment in puncto of the importance of an erotic impression is generally unsafe and inadequate miss miller was under the influence of a deep erotic impression as we have seen 
because of the sum total of the feelings aroused by this it does not seem that this impression was more than dimly realized for the dream had to contain a powerful repetition from analytic experience one knows that the early dreams which patients bring for analysis are none the less of especial interest because of the fact that they bring out criticisms and valuations of the physician's personality which previously would have been asked for directly in vain they enrich the conscious impression which the patient had of his physician and often concerning very important points they are naturally erotic observations which the unconscious was forced to make just because of the quite universal undervaluation and uncertain judgment of the relatively weak erotic impression in the drastic and hyperbolic manner of expression of the dream the impression often appears in almost unintelligible form on account of the immeasurable dimension of the symbol a further peculiarity which seems to rest upon the historic strata of the unconscious is this that an erotic impression to which conscious acknowledgment is denied usurps an earlier and discarded transference and expresses itself in that therefore it frequently happens for example that among young girls at the time of their first love remarkable difficulties develop in the capacity for erotic expression which may be reduced analytically to disturbances through a regressive attempt at resuscitation of the father image or the father imago indeed one might presume something similar in miss miller's case for the idea of the masculine creative deity is a derivation analytically and historically psychologic of the father imago and aims above all to replace the discarded infantile father transference in such a way that for the individual the passing from the narrow circle of the family into the wider circle of human society may be simpler or made easier in the light of this reflection we can see in the poem and its preludium the religious poetically formed product of an introversion depending upon the surrogate of the father imago in spite of the incomplete apperception of the effectual impression essential component parts of this are included in the idea of compensation as marks so to speak of its origin feaster has coined for this the striking expression law of the return of the complex the effectual impression was that of the officer singing in the night watch when the morning stars sang together the idea of this opened a new world to the girl creation this creator has created tone then light and then love that the first to be created should have been tone can be made clear only individually for there is no cosmogony except the gnosis of hermes a generally quite unknown system which would have such tendencies but now we might venture a conjecture which is already apparent and which soon will be proven thoroughly namely the following chain of associations the singer the singing morning stars the god of tone the creator the god of light of the sun of the fire and of love the links of this chain are proven by the material with the exception of sun and fire which i put in parenthesis but which however will be proven through what follows in the further course of the analysis all of these expressions with one exception belong to erotic speech my god star light my son fire of love fiery love etc creator appears indistinct at first but becomes understandable through the reference to the undertone of eros to the vibrating chord of nature which attempts to renew itself in every pair of lovers and awaits the wonder of creation miss miller had taken pains to disclose the unconscious creation of her mind to her understanding 
and indeed through a procedure which agrees in principle with psychoanalysis and therefore leads to the same results as psychoanalysis but as usually happens with laymen and beginners miss miller because she had no knowledge of psychoanalysis left off at the thoughts which necessarily bring the deep complex lying at the bottom of it to light in an indirect that is to say censored manner more than this a simple method merely the carrying out of the thought to its conclusion is sufficient to discover the meaning miss miller finds it astonishing that her unconscious fantasy does not following the mosaic account of creation put light in the first place instead of tone end of hymn of creation excerpt by carl gustav jung translated by beatrice m hinkle from the psychology of the unconscious published in 1916The Invitation, Section 1, from the First Part of Preparation for a Christian Life, by Soren Kierkegaard, translated by Lee M. Hollander. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Preparation for a Christian Life first part comprising about one-fourth of the whole book come hither unto me all ye that labor and are heavy laden and i will give you rest matthew chapter eleven verse twenty eight the invitation section one come hither it is not at all strange if he who is in danger and needs help speedy immediate help perhaps it is not strange if he cries out come hither nor is it strange that a quack cries his wares come hither i cure all maladies alas for in the case of the quack it is only too true that it is the physician who has need of the sick come hither all ye who at extortionate prices can pay for the cure or at any rate for the medicine here is physic for everybody who can pay come hither in all other cases however it is generally true that he who can help must be sought and when found may be difficult of access and if access is had his help may have to be implored a long time and when his help has been implored a long time he may be moved only with difficulty that is he sets a high price on his services and sometimes precisely when he refuses payment or generously asks for none it is only an expression of how infinitely high he values his services on the other hand he christ who sacrificed himself he sacrifices himself here too it is indeed he who seeks those in need of help is himself the one who goes about and calls almost imploringly come hither he the only one who can help and help with what alone is indispensable and can save from the one truly mortal disease he does not wait for people to come to him but comes himself without having been called for it is he who calls out to them it is he who holds out help and what help indeed that simple sage of antiquity socrates was as infinitely right as the majority who do the opposite are wrong in setting no great price whether on himself or his instruction even if he thus in a certain sense proudly expressed the utter difference in kind between payment and his services 
but he was not so solicitous as to beg any one to come to him notwithstanding or shall i say because he was not altogether sure what his help signified for the more sure one is that his help is the only one obtainable the more reason has he in a human sense to ask a great price for it and the less sure one is the more reason has he to offer freely the possible help he has in order to do at least something for others but he who calls himself the saviour and knows that he is he calls out solicitously come hither unto me come hither all ye strange for if he who when it comes to the point perhaps cannot help a single one if such a one should boastfully invite everybody that would not seem so very strange man's nature being such as it is but if a man is absolutely sure of being able to help and at the same time willing to help willing to devote his all in doing so and with all sacrifices then he generally makes at least one reservation which is to make a choice among those he means to help that is however willing one may be still it is not everybody one cares to help one does not care to sacrifice oneself to that extent but he the only one who can really help and really help everybody the only one therefore who really can invite everybody he makes no conditions whatever but utters the invitation which from the beginning of the world seems to have been reserved for him come hither all ye ah human self-sacrifice even when thou art most beautiful and noble when we admire thee most this is a sacrifice still greater which is to sacrifice every provision for one's own self so that in one's willingness to help there is not even the least partiality ah the love that sets no price on oneself that makes one forget altogether that he is the helper and makes one altogether blind as to who it is one helps but infinitely careful only that he be a sufferer whatever else he may be and thus willing unconditionally to help everybody different alas is this from everybody come hither unto me strange for human compassion also and willingly does something for them that labor and are heavy laden one feeds the hungry clothes the naked makes charitable gifts builds charitable institutions and if the compassion be heartfelt perhaps even visits those that labor and are heavy laden but to invite them to come to one that will never do because then all one's household and manner of living would have to be changed for a man cannot himself live in abundance or at any rate in well-being and happiness and at the same time dwell in one and the same house together with and in daily intercourse with the poor and miserable with them that labor and are heavy laden in order to be able to invite them in such wise a man must himself live altogether in the same way as poor as the poorest as lowly as the lowliest familiar with the sorrows and sufferings of life and altogether belonging to the same station as they whom he invites that is they who labor 
and are heavy laden if he wishes to invite a sufferer he must either change his own condition to be like that of the sufferer or else change that of the sufferer to be like his own for if this is not done the difference will stand out only the more by contrast and if you wish to invite all those who suffer for you may make an exception with one of them and change his condition it can be done only in one way which is to change your condition so as to live as they do provided your life be not already lived thus as was the case with him who said come hither unto me all ye that labor and are heavy laden thus said he and they who lived with him saw him and behold there was not even the least thing in his manner of life to contradict it with the silent and truthful eloquence of actual performance his life expresses even though he had never in his life said these words his life expresses come hither unto me all ye that labor and are heavy laden he abides by his word or he himself is the word he is what he says and also in this sense he is the word john chapter one verse one all ye that labor and are heavy laden strange his only concern is lest there be a single one who labors and is heavy laden who does not hear this invitation neither does he fear that too many will come ah heart room makes house room but where wilt thou find heart room if not in his heart he leaves it to each one how to understand his invitation he has a clear conscience about it for he has invited all those that labor and are heavy laden but what means it then to labor and be heavy laden why does he not offer a clearer explanation so that one may know exactly whom he means and why is he so chary of his words ah thou narrow-minded one he is so chary of his words lest he be narrow-minded and thou narrow-hearted one he is so chary of his words lest he be narrow-hearted for such is his love and love has regard to all as to prevent any one from troubling and searching his heart whether he too be among those invited and he who would insist on a more definite explanation is he not likely to be some self-loving person who is calculating whether this explanation does not particularly fit himself one who does not consider that the more of such exact explanations are offered the more certainly some few would be left in doubt as to whether they were invited ah man why does thine eye see only thyself why is it evil because he is good matthew chapter twenty verse fifteen the invitation to all men opens the arms of him who invites and thus he stands of aspect everlasting but no sooner is a closer explanation attempted which might help one or the other to another kind of certainty than his aspect would be transformed and as it were a shadow of change would pass over his countenance i will give you rest strange for then the words come hither unto me must be understood to mean stay with me i am rest or it is rest to remain with me 
it is not then as in other cases where he who helps and says come hither must afterwards say now depart again explaining to each one where the help he needs is to be found where the healing herb grows which will cure him or where the quiet spot is found where he may rest from labor or where the happier continent exists where one is not heavy laden but no he who opens his arms inviting every one ah if all all they that labor and are heavy laden came to him he would fold them all to his heart saying stay with me now for to stay with me is rest the helper himself is the help ah strange he who invites everybody and wishes to help everybody his manner of treating the sick is as if calculated for every sick man and as if every sick man who comes to him were his only patient for otherwise a physician divides his time among many patients who however great their number still are far far from being all mankind he will prescribe the medicine he will say what is to be done and how it is to be used and then he will go to some other patient or in case the patient should visit him he will let him depart the physician cannot remain sitting all day with one patient and still less can he have all his patients about him in his home and yet sit all day with one patient without neglecting the others for this reason the helper and his help are not one and the same thing the help which the physician prescribes is kept with him by the patient all day so that he may constantly use it while the physician visits him now and again or he visits the physician now and again but if the helper is also the help why then he will stay with the sick man all day or the sick man with him ah strange that it is just this helper who invites all men end of the invitation section one from the first part of preparation for a christian life by soren kierkegaard translated by lee m hollander read for librivox by sue anderson january days chapter forty eight from in new england fields and woods by roland e robinson this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org chapter forty eight january days in these midwinter days how muffled is the earth in its immaculate raiment so disguised in whiteness that familiar places are strange rough hollows smooth to mere undulations deceitful to the eye and feet and level fields so piled with heaps and ridges that their owners scarcely recognize them the hovel is as regally roofed as the palace the rudest fence is a hedge of pearl finer than a wall of marble and the meanest wayside weed is a white flower of fairyland the woods which frost and november winds stripped of their leafy thatch are roofed again now with an arabesque of alabaster more delicate than the green canopy that summer unfolded and all the floor is set in noiseless pavement traced with a shifting pattern of blue shadows in these silent aisles the echoes are smothered at their birth there is no response of airy voices to the faint call of the winter birds the sound of the axe stroke flies no farther than the pungent fragrance of the smoke that drifts in a blue haze from the chopper's fire the report of the gun awakes no answering report 
and each mellow note of the hound comes separate to the ear with no jangle of reverberations fox and hound wallow through the snow a crumbling furrow that obliterates identity of either trail yet there are tracks that tell as plain as written words who made them here have fallen lightly as snowflakes the broad pads of the hare white as the snow he trod there the parallel tracks of another winter masker the weasel and those of the squirrel linking tree to tree the leaps of a tiny wood mouse are lightly marked upon the feathery surface to where there is the imprint of a light swift pinion on either side and the little story of his wandering ends one crimson blood drop the period that marks the finny in the blue shadow at the bottom of that winding furrow are the dainty footprints of a grouse and you wonder why he so strong of wing should choose to wade laboriously the clogging snow even in his briefest trip rather than make his way through the unresisting air and the snow-written record of his wayward wanderings tells not why suddenly as if a mine had been sprung where your next footstep should fall and with almost as startling though harmless effect another of his wild tribe bursts upward through the unmarked white floor and goes whirling and clattering away scattering in powdery ruin the maze of delicate tracery the snowfall rot and vanishes leaving only an aerial pathway of naked twigs to mark his impetuous passage in the twilight of an evergreen thicket sits a great horned owl like a hermit in his cell in pious contemplation of his own holiness and the world's wickedness but this recluse hates not sin only daylight in mankind out in the fields you may find the white-robed brother of this grey friar a pilgrim from the far north brooding in the very face of the sun on some stack or outlying barn but he will not suffer you to come so near to him as will the solemn anchorite who stares at you unmoved as a graven image till you come within the very shadows of his roof marsh and channel are scarcely distinguishable now but by the white domes of the muskrat's winter homes and here and there a sprawling thicket or button bush for the rank growth of weeds is beaten flat and the deep snow covers it and the channel ice in one unbroken sheet champlain's sheltered bays and coves are frozen and white with snow or frost and the open water whether still or storm-tossed black beneath clouds or bluer than the blue dome that arches it looks as cold as ice and snow sometimes its steaming breath lies close above it sometimes mounts in swaying lofty columns to the sky but always cold and ghostly without expression of warmth or life so far away to hoary peaks that shine with a glittering gleam against the blue rim of the sky or to the furthest blue-gray line of woodland that borders the horizon stretches the universal whiteness so coldly shines the sun from the low curve of his course and so chilly comes the lightest waft of wind from wheresoever it listeth that it tasks the imagination to picture any land on all the earth where spring is just awakening fresh life or where summer dwells amid green leaves and bright flowers the music of birds and running waters and of warm waves on pleasant shores or autumn yet lingers in the gorgeousness of many hues how far off beyond this world seems the possibility of such seasons how enduring and relentless this which encompasses us and then at the close of the brief white day the sunset paints a promise and a prophecy in a blaze of color on the sky the gray clouds kindle with red and yellow fire that burns about their purple hearts in tints of infinite variety while behind them in the dark blue rampart of the mountains flames the last glory of the departing sun fading in a tint of tender green to the upper blue even the cold snow at our feet flushes with warm color and the eastern hills blush roseate against the climbing darkening shadow of the earth it is as if some land of summer whose brightness has never been told lay unveiled before us its delectable mountains splendid with innumerable hues 
its lakes and streams of gold rippling to purple shores seeming not so far before us but that we might by a little journey come to them end of january days chapter forty eight from in new england fields and woods by roland e robinson read for librivox dot org by nemo cranborg's marionettes by lola ridge from the january eleventh nineteen nineteen edition of the dial this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Matt Perard. Whitman, and not Poe, was the true pioneer of American poetry. Poe filled narrow, unpliant forms with a wild, fantastic, supple life he played freely within circumscribed boundaries because boundaries did not constrict him he was the kind of bird that sings most sweetly in a cage but whitman's was a grandly nihilistic gesture he assailed the whole bastille of form and brought it tumbling about his own ears he was a liberator of rhythms as nietzsche was of ethics and at that he achieved no modern miracle his was the world-old revolt of life weary of constraining her mighty rhythms in piano tunes wholly a democrat he was concerned only with the broad and common currents of existence whatever surrounded and included the life of crowds and like most democrats he was unaware of nuances but in a literary sense his service to america equaled that of washington and the co-fathers of the revolution like theirs his declaration of independence sounded a barbaric yawp over the roofs of the world and though we may smile tolerantly at the clumsy ways of a pioneer and clear away his good rank grasses it is over his unrailed clearing rather than along the slender trail of poe that the truly american poets will pass to their own he has made it easier for men so unlike as frost and sandberg and boldenheim and masters to grow and push out horizons even vachel lindsay would not have had space enough for his adorable ragtime if whitman's breath had not blown over the stucco palaces and rose gardens and high english hedges and left a great clear space like a prairie for free rhythms to gallop in but of all the poets that are now travailing out of this large incoherence that is america cranborg is most strangely and poignantly alone whether like some elfin hamlet folded in an ironic smile as in a cloak or gazing out of his own mushrooms solemn-eyed gnome-like with naively interested eyes on an unrelated world he seems to have no artistic roots this is apparent even in mushrooms for never since the great walt scattered his leaves over an offended continent has there been a poetic firstling that has shown so few influences its method then tentative uncertain seemed a seed blown from nowhere now we feel its upward growth in these plays for poem mimes in which common words made taut like strings seem to have acquired a new and silvery timbre cranborg seems to melt life as in a crucible and pour it into these quaintly human marionettes from whom it perpetually burns over except for manikin and minikin who probably flouted their begetter's plan by announcing themselves as full-blown egos one can imagine these little dramas being staged in souls and played by the people who live in people so eerily intimate are they all six plays have a musical structure deftly surely with his sensitive musician's fingers cranborg touches those tenuous quivering threads that radiate beneath the compact surface of life first he makes a silence a silence of wheels and cranes 
and a silence of subways and barrel organs even a silence of feet stamping upon gallery floors and you who would watch his swaying motifs in their rhythmic dances and listen to their subtle music must pass through this luminous silence that surrounds them like an aura but if you would enjoy the full lustre of each silvery dissonance you must hush those two clamorous memories of broadway and the blind white scream of spotlights for Kramborg sweeps away all ready-made gestures and all unnecessary noises he deals direct with life and life needs silence to be heard when the curtain rises on mannequin and minikin a bisque play we see only a mantel shelf and a huge clock ticking away eternity between two aristocratic bisque figures a boy in cerise and a girl in cornflower blue the servant girl whom we never see but of whose nearness we are always aware has turned them away from each other so that they see only the everlasting armchair the everlasting tiger skin the everlasting yellow green and purple books and into these two inanimates who recall their childhood in the english museum krimborg has poured a full sweet tide of life we do not think of them as puppets but as living essences gestures of surrounded beauty captured like two bright birds and held static in time minikin asking who made me what i am who dreamed me in motionless clay or voicing her jealousy of the servant minikin who does not know how old she is is as perfect of her kind as any of the great characters of literature manikin says in his sad wise philosophy the life of an animate is a procession of deaths with but a secret sorrowing candle guttering lower and lower on the path to the grave the life of an inanimate is as serenely enduring as all still things are and i feel this little play to be of such stuff as will prove to be serenely enduring unlike some of cranbrook's other work it has no loose repetitions straying like uncared-for children and no frayed ends the whole is correlated into a perfect form a lesser artist might have made a catastrophic finale by letting the servant girl shatter the great happy centuries ahead by sweeping minikin from the everlasting shelf as it is the play leaves off on the progressive chord only the mellow chimes of the clock striking the hour round the silence like the last touch on a jewel of the comedies lima beans a scherzo play with a dainty allegro movement is a prolonged ripple of quaintly satirical laughter in which krimborg delicately whimsically as some supernaturally wise gnome mocks at life with her own symbols jack's house a cubic play is not so easily disposed of it has a way of leaving one's conception of it swinging foolishly like an empty cage at first one follows pleasantly the miming of its two figures and smiles at jack's expectations of his doll wife who is hardly more than a delicious pout and what has a pout to do with homemaking later this little oblique satire on the american home acts as an emotional irritant there is something vaguely chilling about an atmosphere where two black pillows on our green couch are the make-believe children besides the poet's thought has a trick of whisking into ambush and out again tagging and dancing away making impish mouths one leaves it with a sense of futility and of being wounded uselessly and of feeling bits of severed life fumbling for each other and yet for those of us who have seen jack's house produced by the other players and listened to the wistfully importunate accompaniment of julian friedman's music this parody of a home will rock in our memory no matter what we grow to in blue and green a shadow play love avid morbidly aware eternally touching and swaying apart is again the dominant motif 
the two figures talking in silvery monotones while fragments of their lives dance a shadow dance against a blue california sky compare their dissonances with an exquisite and intimate clarity flowing through each other's consciousness like two streams of faintly iridescent water if a man and woman could so commune through their mortal opacity then these two might be any man and any woman who had tried to mould the other to his own image only to find the image mean commonplace bitterly familiar a sight to be effaced with the first recognition this thought of our multiple spiritual recreations of each other finds constant expression in cranbord's work the old figure in when the willow nods says of the girl your least sly look recreates folk to your image and it is the main theme of people who die in this lonely dream play love has almost ceased to importune her dead children and the two figures are as shells that we hold to our ear and through which we hear the roaring backwash of life it seems in a sense to be a sequel to blue and green penetrating even deeper than the latter into inner sacristics as dramatic structures these two plays are the weakest in the group perhaps they are spiritual records done at a too close perspective to be expressed in conscious terms of art but in order to assume any dramatic or even any permanent literary value they would have to be recast and all those groping segments constrained into some definite form as it is they are as good wine that has been spilled on the ground instead of poured into clear-cut goblets the book is at once a challenge and a stimulus it reminds us that the artist's interpretation of life must be more than a record of action or a corroboration of registered emotions kipling achieved these brilliantly and reached his period before thirty our individual reactions to the tangible beat in ever dwindling vibrations the exploration of the intangible is the one inexhaustible adventure blows gifts kisses wine stars winds sun the time comes to every artist when he has answered even these and when the raised invisible signs by which our mute souls quibble to each other need to be re-energized by the impetus of some new discovery and it is this spirit of discovery this getting out and making a clearing instead of huddling in mental tenements that is cranbourg's great significance in one almost painfully clutching gesture that of musically monotonous repetitions he resembles maeterlinck but he has none of the great belgian's fear of personal extinction his spiritual attitude is serenely robust and his regret is never for people who die but for the people who die in people those fragile and lovely images the ego fashions of its beloved whether we like him or not it will soon be obligatory to recognize cranbourg as an impelling force in the new american drama in discarding old forms he has merely thrown away what to him are worn-out swaddlings no longer holy enough or spacious enough to contain the living growing essence his aim is to make life face itself anew by the aid of new symbols life never to be persuaded or reconciled by its own bitterly familiar image end of cranbourg's marionettes by lola ridge letter to tramps to tramps the unemployed the disinherited and miserable by lucy e parsons this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A word to the 35,000 now tramping the streets of this great city. With hands in pockets, gazing listlessly about you with the evidences of wealth and pleasure of which you own no part. Not sufficient even to purchase yourself a bit of food with which to appease the pangs of hunger now gnawing at your vitals. 
It is with you and the hundreds of thousands of others similarly situated in this great land of plenty that I wish to have a word. Have you not worked hard all your life, since you were old enough for your labor to be of use in the production of wealth? Have you not toiled long, hard, and laboriously in producing wealth, and in all those years of drudgery, do you not know you have produced thousands upon thousands of dollars worth of wealth, which you did not then, do not now, and unless you act, never will own any part in? Do you not know that when you were harnessed to a machine, and that machine harnessed to steam, and thus you toiled your ten, twelve, and sixteen hours in the twenty-four, that during this time and all these years you received only enough of your labor product to furnish yourself the bare, coarse necessities of life, and that when you wished to purchase anything for yourself and family, it always had to be of the cheapest quality. If you wanted to go anywhere, you had to wait until Sunday. So little did you receive your unremitting toil that you dare not stop for a moment, as it were. And do you not know that with all your squeezing, pinching, and economizing, that you never were enabled to keep but a few days ahead of the wolves of want? And that at last, when the caprice of your employer saw fit to create an artificial famine by limiting production, that the fires in the furnace were extinguished, the iron horse to which you had been harnessed was stilled, the factory door locked up, you turned upon the highway, a tramp, with hunger in your stomach, and rags upon your back. Yet your employer told you that it was overproduction which made him close up. Who cared for the bitter tears and heart pangs of your loving wife and helpless children when you bid them a loving God bless you and turned upon the tramper's road to seek employment elsewhere? I say who cared for those heartaches and pains? You were only a tramp now. To be execrated and denounced as a worthless tramp and a vagrant by that very class who had been engaged all those years in robbing you and yours. Then can you not see that the good boss or the bad boss cuts no figure whatever, that you are the common prey of both, and that their mission is simply robbery? Can you not see that it is the industrial system and not the boss which must be changed? Now when all these bright summer and autumn days are going by, and you have no employment, and consequently can save up nothing. And when the winter's blast sweeps down from the north, and all the earth is wrapped in a shroud of ice, hearken not to the voice of the hypocrite who will tell you that it was ordained by God that the poor ye have always, or to the arrogant robber who will say to you that you drank up all your wages last summer when you had work, and that is the reason why you have nothing now, and the workhouse or the woodyard is too good for you that you ought to be shot. And shoot you they will if you present your petition in too emphatic a manner. So hearken not to them, but list. Next winter, when the cold blasts are keeping through the rents in your seedy garments, when the frost is biting your feet through the holes in your worn-out shoes, and when all wretchedness seems to have centered in and upon you, when misery has marked you for her own, and life has become a burden and existence a mockery, when you have walked the streets by day and slept upon hard boards by night, and at last determined by your own hand to take your life, for you would rather go out into utter nothingness than to longer endure an existence which has become such a burden. So perchance you determine to dash yourself into the cold embrace of the lake rather than longer suffer thus but halt before you commit this last tragic act in the drama of your simple existence. Stop. Is there nothing you can do to ensure those whom you are about to orphan against a like fate? The waves will only dash over you in mockery of your rash act, but stroll you down the avenues of the rich and look upon the magnificent plate windows into their voluptuous homes, and here you will discover the very identical robbers who have despoiled you and yours. Then let your tragedy be enacted here. Awaken them from their wanton sports at your expense. Send forth your petition and let them read it by the red glare of destruction. Thus, when you cast one long, lingering look behind, you can be assured that you have spoken to these robbers in the only language which they have ever been able to understand. 
for they have never yet deigned to notice any petition from their slaves that they were not compelled to read by the red glare bursting from the cannon's mouths, or that was not handed to them upon the point of the sword. You need no organization when you make up your mind to present this kind of petition. In fact, an organization would be a detriment to you. But each of you hungry tramps who read these lines avail yourselves of those little methods of warfare which science has placed in the hands of the poor man, and you will become a power in this or any other land. Learn the use of explosives. End of Letter to Tramps To Tramps, the Unemployed, the Disinherited, and Miserable by Lucy E. Parsons